Anyway, here we are up to uh, embedded operating systems. Uh, this is the new chapter in the book, added in the latest revision, and a very good idea. That might have been the one before this, but um, this is, as you may have noticed, security is sort of like politics. is an endless succession of scandals where people find out that something awful has been going on, and in retrospect, uh, everyone should have seen it sooner. And um, the Y2K crisis in 1999 brought to people's awareness the fact that everything around us is now run by a computer. And the next thing we learned is it's all being run by computers that were not very well designed, of course, because computer technology changes so fast that a computer designed in the 90s is fantastically out of date these days. Um, and that's not true of other kinds of equipment. So again, we have um, the rapid pace of computer technology colliding with the very slow pace of infrastructure technology. If you build something like a water plant or an aircraft control tower, you expect to use it for 20 or 30 years. And if you buy a computer, you realistically can't expect it to be very impressive for more than two or three years before a much better computer comes out and this one seems ridiculously out of date. And therefore, there's a huge problem when you have computer-controlled infrastructure that people are going to keep using stuff that is very badly out of date, even though that is a much bigger risk with computers than it is for, say, mechanical systems. So that's the game here. There's a, um, so the, all these computerized devices have to have an operating system, and those are embedded systems. And what they generally are is multi-purpose operating systems that have just been shrunken by discarding a large portion of it so that they can run with less memory and less power and such. So that's the game here. Um, anything that's computerized but is not a general purpose computer is considered an embedded system. So the GPS in your car is because you can't send email on it or run Microsoft Word. All you can do is the one thing it's designed for. And your ATM machine and voting machines and now everything, your, your refrigerator, your kids' toys are now computerized and connected to the internet and everything else. And they're all supposedly specialized for just one purpose. And you could write a custom operating system just for that purpose, but that's far too much bother. So what everybody does is just take a general purpose operating system and slam it on there and uh, only turn on some of the features. Um, and that's the gamer. These, so you have these embedded operating systems that have somehow been stripped down. And there are different ways to do it. Uh, the normal ones use the multi-layer operating systems we have. You know, if you were on a well, Mac, for example, and you hit print, you do not know how many seconds it's going to be before the printer goes. And it's not even constant. It might be doing something in the background that slows it down, and nobody really cares. So that's like driving a car on ice. You hit the control, and you don't, it doesn't take effect until some random time later. And you don't normally care. But if you're going to have, say, a computer in your car or a jet fighter, that's not OK. And so there, there are embedded systems that are designed to be real-time operating systems. So you know exactly how much delay there's going to be between a signal and a response. And that's much better, of course, if you're doing something time sensitive. Um, nowadays, your building is completely full of embedded systems. You've got the uh, heating, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and burglar alarm are all integrated, which Target found out to their sadness. That's how Target got hacked. They got hacked through the heating and ventilation system, which was computer controlled, connected to the other computers. And that contractor had a name and password to let them into that system. And so the hackers hacked the contractor and came in through that system. Uh, this is quite common. I read a uh, pen testing book maybe eight years ago from a company that wanted to pen test an armored car a truck company that delivered money in London. And they spent nine months preparing for it. And they eventually found that although their um, internal computer systems were essentially impenetrable, the drivers had a, a laptop in their truck, which they would use to report their location back to the home base as they drove around picking up money in the armored car. And one of the drivers had put something unsafe on one of those laptops. And it was only turned on while making a delivery. So you had to hang around near them, pick up the wireless signal, get in that laptop, and implant malware, which was then phone home from the home system. And that's how they got in. And that's why, you know, that's why I'm teaching classes in this way. The first thing you learn is attack. You don't learn defense until later because defense is very difficult and very frustrating. You have to have nobody in your whole company make a mistake, and that's almost impossible, whereas attack is very easy. You just learn how to overcome the simplest software flaws, and then you wait for someone to make a mistake and put on something unsafe. And that happens all the bloody time. Anyway, so that's the aim here. You, everything in your uh, network is, of course, an embedded system. Your firewalls, your routers, your switches, uh, your network attached storage devices. 
Nowadays, your cloud services and your cloud backups are all vulnerable, and people are hacking people right and left. Uh, you may remember the two or three famous um, iCloud breaches where they got celebrity pictures nude. There were like two or three guys in a row that did this, and it never was completely clear how they did it, but the most common way to do it, which is probably what they did, was to just send emails to celebrities with a link for them to click on and a good story, and some of them click on the link so they get some of their passwords. And once they have your iCloud password, they can dump all the photos off your phone, and an incredible number of people use their phone to take photos they intend to be private, and yet their phone is backing everything up to iCloud. And these two things are, uh, you know, that's a problem. Currently, there's a, a hacking group that says they're trying to blackmail Apple and get Apple to pay them a ransom because they claim they have uh, some enormous number of passwords that get into people's iCloud accounts and they're going to dump out all their data. And Apple says, nobody hacked us. What they did was go through other companies that got hacked and dump out their passwords and they're going to get in people who have reused the same password on another system, which is very likely true. And that probably means in a legal sense that Apple is in no way liable for this. But in a public relations sense, the, Apple, the people may end up blaming Apple for not saving them somehow, but I must say, I, I think Apple's right. I've been having arguments with a guy about this on Twitter. How is Apple supposed to know? The whole point of iCloud is if you lose your phone, you go to some other phone and you put in your iCloud password and you say, okay, synchronize this with my iCloud stuff. You can't do two-factor authentication because you lost your phone. So if I have your real iCloud password, I can totally get all your stuff and I really do not see what Apple can do about this. Unless they want to make it so you have to like drive to an office and submit your driver's license or your fingerprint to get, get your new phone up. And I don't think most of their customers really want to have that much hassle when they actually lose their phone. And this is a fundamental weakness. When you have real customers forgetting their passwords, there has to be some way to get in without your password or you know, with other problems. And the easier that is, the easier it is for bad guys. It's just a fundamental issue. Anyway, so um, these embedded systems are typically recycling code. Um, it's too expensive to write custom code for everything, so people just use standard packages, standard operating systems, and they often make a common mistake, which isn't found for a while. Um, there, you can therefore write worms and trojans and attacks that'll work against a wide variety of them. Uh, the Windows and Linux vulnerabilities that were present in the full operating system are often also present in the embedded version of the operating system. Windows CE is one of Microsoft's earlier um, compact versions intended for embedded systems, and they actually released some of its source code to the public, which is not common. Um, the US military and Microsoft, and for that matter, I'm not sure about Apple, um, very strongly believe that by keeping their code secret, they improve security because it's harder to find the vulnerabilities. And so they do release their code for controlled audit. Uh, they allow governments to audit Microsoft code be because some governments require that legally before they can use it in government offices, but they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement and not release the source code, although some of it has leaked out. So the latest version of this is Windows 10 IoT for the Internet of Things. Um, you may remember with Windows 8, Microsoft decided they were going to make one operating system for every platform, from a cell phone to a tablet to a desktop to a server, and they've continued in that vein to the extent they're no longer forcing you to have the same user interface on every device, which really was a terrible idea, but underneath the hood it's all the same, and Windows 10 IoT is just a way to make small stripped-down versions of Windows with fewer features, less memory required, and less power required to run on various devices and that's what they would like you to do. I don't know how many devices are actually running Windows 10 IoT. Uh, it seems to me like almost all the ones I come across are running some version of Linux, which has been the original system to do this. It is Linux gets as small as you want. There's a, uh, I think it's tiny OS or something. There's a version of Linux that fits on a floppy disk. The whole thing is less than 1.4 megabytes. You know, Linux has been around forever and it comes in every size. So you can make it as small as you want. Of course you lose features, but you can do something with even just a few megabytes. So VxWorks is another um, OS that's been used for a long time. Our embedded devices, it's used in spacecraft. It's been around for a really long time. Um, and it looks like this. Uh, so does Windows uh, versions that shrink down. They give you a, um, a control panel where you choose how to strip it down. The Windows one looks sort of like the add or remove programs feature in control panel in Windows. They broke all their features up into 10 or 20 groups and you can say, I need networking, I don't need a camera, I don't need a printer, and remove large portions of the operating system to keep just the parts you need to do what you're doing. 
So the military fighters are running something called the Green Hill operating system, which is, um, this of course, is the specialized for military systems. Uh, the problem with military systems is ISO 27000 certification, essentially. You'll come across this if you get a CISSP. Um, there are, if you build a product and you just want to sell it at Home Depot, you can just make something like a meter and just sell it, and nobody asks where did the components come from, how many security reviews have been done and all that, but you can't sell it to the military. The military can only buy something if you can prove not, that not only does it meet a certain level of performance, but that you can prove that you checked your entire supply chain to find out where all the components came from and, and, and your management, and at many levels there were papers filed to prove that it had undergone a security review at many levels. And um, so that process takes five years and costs a million dollars to accomplish, and that's called ISO 27000 certification. And if you get that certification, you can now sell products to the military. And it means for every actual product at the end, there is a blizzard of paper and, and uh, formal reviews and administrative work going on to prove that you considered all these possible security <coughs> risks at every step of creating it. And that's what they've got here. And the, uh, the in particular Green Hill has mills, which means it can run multiple levels of classification on the same hardware. Uh, the original plan for the military was an air gap, and there were people that had up to seven computers on their desk. You'd have one computer for top secret, and you have a separate computer for secret, and a separate computer for classified, and a separate computer for unclassified, and then there were horizontal controls based on need to know, and all those things had to be separated by an air gap. So none of them were connected to the internet, except the unclassified one, and the only way data moves from one to the other was with USB sticks or something. And this mills means it's certified to run different levels of security on the same hardware, and you have some degree of confidence that it's not leaking from one to the other. <clears throat> anyway, then you've got embedded code in your printers and switches, and if you get um, Cisco routers, the normal Cisco routers that sit in Iraq, those are running iOS, which we've talked about before, and it's, a, it's not equal to the iOS that runs on your phone. It has a capital I instead of a small i, but it's a little simple thing like DOS. But if you have a high-performance router that is a dozen racks and moves in enough traffic for a whole ISP, that runs Qnix, which is their special uh, ultra-high-performance routing software. And then there's RTMs used in space systems, and that's the game. And so what happens, most companies have many different devices, and most homes now have many different devices running different embedded operating systems, and therefore you have what they call a larger attack surface. If you're a bad guy trying to get in, when you scan, there are many devices running different versions of things, and it is very difficult for the owner to really understand all the risks or patch all the problems. So this is why companies usually, if you want to be secure, you limit the choice of users. Like you have to use the Microsoft version of everything, Microsoft email client, Microsoft email server, Microsoft instant messenger. Uh, that makes it a whole lot easier to know what's out there and control it than just letting everybody use a different version of everything. Now uh, the two general categories of embedded systems are monolithic, well two operating systems in general, a monolithic kernel and microkernel. The monolithic kernel is what your multi-purpose operating system has. And this is what developed as the most efficient way to make multi-purpose devices. When I started all this in the 70s and the 80s, I got a computer and you had to buy it with a printer and you could only print on that one printer. And if you got a new word processor, you had to get a new printer to go with it because there was no separation between the printer driver and the software and the word processor. And that, of course, turned out to be a not the way to do it. What's better is to have hardware down here, and you can have any, you can have any peripherals attached to your hardware, and you buy a printer from anywhere, but the person who makes the printer has to write a device driver. And the device driver takes a standard command to print and converts it into a, um, whatever electrical signals are needed to reach your printer. So you can make your printer any way you want, but you write a driver, and the higher levels of the operating system do not need to know what printer you're using. They just know that it'll be converted into some standard language. So you have multiple layers here, and just like the OSI model in networking, and that means you can build a device that just serves one limited purpose and sell it, and it can be plugged into any other pieces of hardware or software to build a general purpose device. This is the best way to support a wide variety of hardware. It also is responsible for this problem with real time. You, when you try to do something like you're in a car and you step on the brakes, you ask the layer below you to please step on the brakes, to ask the layer below you to please step on the brakes, to ask the layer below you what brand your brakes are and what the driver is, and you don't know how long all that takes, and that's not good enough for a car. So um, that's an issue. The alternative way to do this is a microkernel OS, 
where you have not very many layers and everything is specialized. This is the way really early versions of Linux were. So if you had a new hardware and even new software, you had to recompile the kernel because everything was specialized in one kernel. This, of course, is smaller and faster and more efficient if you don't change anything, but it's much harder to adapt for general purpose. So the general purpose operating systems we use like Windows and the Mac OS are like this, and some of the special purpose ones are minor microkernel, which means you have to spend more time customizing the operating system, and you have to keep readjusting it every time you change any hardware, but it will be smaller and faster, and probably more secure. Although security is really not so much a matter of general design, it's a matter of how carefully you do this how many mistakes you make. But in general, you would think this would have a larger um, attack surface. There are more possible places to go wrong in a bigger product. So that's the game. Embedded Linux is one option is the monolithic operating system. And this, of course, it makes it easier to modify the hardware and the software, but it makes it bigger. Um, all right, so real-time Linux is a microkernel extension that turns a regular Linux into an RTOS, and that's one option. Uh, there's also Linux designed specifically, specifically for home routers. Uh, wireless equipment in general is kind of curious. There's only a small number of manufacturers for wireless chips, like three or four, and they are all the same, and they all have all the features that any router could have, and the only reason your home router doesn't have VLANs and the ability to run backwards to put the internet on the wireless side and the local area network on the wired side is just because of the software that doesn't let you have those features. The hardware can do it, so if you put on a Linux-based OS, you can gain access to all these things, and one way they talk about this is changing your $30 router into a $300 router. So now you can traffic shape and filter and all sorts of things. Um, one thing that's also true is that that Linux-based OS is not 100% matching the hardware, so it tends to crash more. So my friends that started doing this, said, in fact, if you are a tech support at a company, you learn pretty quickly not to do this and just use the standard software that came at the router. It's more likely to stay up and be reliable. But here's an example of DDWRT um, giving you monitoring bandwidth, which is not a feature you typically get on a home router, but only a business router. But it's no reason you can't have it if you just change the software in the router. Um, and here's OpenWRT. I've used this for a while. Uh, you, they always make a big deal out of maybe each version of it after a drink. Uh, which is probably not what I regard as a good sign, but that's very common in the open source community. There's an incredible association between security and booze. Anyway, um, the, and you install this thing and then you have a command line. Now there's a GUI on it also. Um, but these are various groups that make these versions of Linux specifically to run on home routers. You can't put it on every home router, but you can put it on quite a few of them. And so OpenWRT has a nice panel you can open here, and you can choose your software off a list. You can put in all sorts of good stuff. You can add a VPN to it, and you can add other things. You can NAT 6 to 4 if you want to convert IP version 6 to IP version 4, and so on. There are just dozens of additional packages you can add, um, sort of like Firefox extensions, to give your router more and more crazy features. It might be it. You might want to look more into VPNs since the uh, decision recently by the Congress to let your ISP spy on you and sell the data without your knowledge. That's a uh, significant reversal of the Obama policy, but that is expected to be the law of the land within a week or two, and um, I wonder how bad it'll get. Some people are talking about selling individual people's browser histories. I would think that would probably violate some other law, but I'm not, a, I'm not an expert. But what they certainly can do is target ads based on that information in aggregate anonymous fashion, like Google does. And in a way, I can see there's no reason. Why isn't your ISP entitled to get that money the same way Google does, by reading all your email? Because what? They're going to block it. Well, what are they going to block? What? What, is, what are they going to block? Like, unless they block, like, ad blockers. Uh, that's true. That's true. But your ISP could, for example, put in the terms of service, you're not allowed to use ad block. I don't know, they, that's issue. The ISP, there's certainly lots of things ISPs could do to make money. And the big issue I've seen in the last five years has been, does the Federal Communication Commission actually have the authority to place limits on what ISPs do? And the result seems to be no, that they really don't have the authority to make these rules. But anyway, uh, we're going to live through more interesting times. If you don't want your ISP stooping on you, you could get a VPN client, and then your VPN company would be the only one that can snoop on you, and I really don't know how you're going to know if they're doing that. 
But anyway, it's, uh, it would stop your ISP from seeing what you're doing if you think that's a good move. Um, all right, so I got a few eye clicker questions. Come grab one if you need one. So which one of these runs an embedded OS? All right, I guess I'll create a 35. Looks like that'll be enough. And that's the self-checkout machine. It's the only thing there at the right level of complexity. Um, these two are, not, are actually not computers. One of the few things around that still aren't computers, and these are general purpose computers. So the checkout machine is the special purpose computer, and that's the embedded OS. All right, which one is intended specifically for routers? Open WRT. All right, a popular answer, but not too popular. But that's um, that's all named after DDWRT. I don't know what it stands for, but oh, it's the WRT54G was a very popular Linksys router, and uh, people named their OS I think after that. All right, and uh, which one is a Microsoft product with some of the source code published? which is not normal at all for Microsoft. All right, and that's a Windows CE. Which one is specifically designed for the military? Green Hill. All right, good. So, early enough, I guess we'll keep going a bit here. So, uh, of course, the embedded OS has vulnerabilities, just like any other OS. Um, here is one of the worms that targeted home routers and cable modems. Uh, there were a lot of attacks that attacked home routers. There was a guy that took up a, over 100,000 home routers and used it to do a scan of the entire internet and published the results. Um, 
The home routers often have a default password, and that means it's basically a free Linux server for anybody to use, um, as long as you don't mind breaking the law. There is a password is available to get on there. And Windows Mobile, of course, has its own flood of vulnerabilities. You can search for them. There's security focus. And you see they got um, script injection and a dial of service and Bluetooth vulnerabilities and so on, just like you'd expect. Uh, the big difference being that most of these are never patched and never fixed because many manufacturers do not even bother to create patches for embedded systems. And even if they do, most people don't install them because they just keep using it as long as it works. So uh, it's a problem. Uh, attacks keep getting more and more serious. And embedded OSs have the same series of attacks. You can attack the devices that handle cash, like ATM machines. You can put malware on the ATMs to steal the credit card numbers. You can put skimmers, hardware devices, on, on the part that reads the card to make an extra copy of the card. You can do lots of things. You can just physically steal the machine and pry it open and take the cash out of it. There are all various ways to do it. Um, so the Y2K software flaw is what brought this to people's attention. In, as 1999 turned out to 2000, it turned out that a large amount of the software running embedded systems was running COBOL, and they were actually using a two-digit base 10 integer for the year because they wrote these things in the 70s and they didn't expect them still to be in use in the 90s. And so when it changed from 99 to 00, it would think it was 1900 instead of 2000, and therefore it would be the wrong day of the week and all sorts of bad things might happen. Um, so they got a bunch of COBOL programmers back out of retirement to um, fix all that COBOL code so all those embedded systems could keep going. By the way, I have been told that there are now jobs for people programming in long dead languages like Fortran and COBOL, and perhaps you should even be learning them. It's hard for me to believe this can really be the best strategy rather than learning something modern like Swift or C Sharp or Java, but there are so many embedded systems running these old languages that the people that originally knew how to program them have long died or quit. So it's an option. If you are interested in learning old languages, <laughs> there apparently are an increasing number of jobs in them, although I think most jobs are from startups that want to write new things using new languages. And I wouldn't recommend it as a career strategy focusing on old languages, but apparently it's not as crazy as I thought. So one problem with embedded operating systems is not only are they running small, vulnerable, out-of-date software, they're also all connected to the internet. And in a sort of a cynical move, like um, you will notice the do product documentation almost always tells you don't connect it to the internet. But of course, everybody does because that's the whole point of it. Why do you bother having a computer controlled system except so you can control it from your main office and you don't have to have people driving to every location where it is. So it saves so much money to have things connected to the internet that they almost all are. One wise uh, procedure which very few people follow, is to connect it through a VPN concentrator to the internet. If you're going to connect it to the internet, there ought to be another device verifying like a digital certificate or a name and a complex password before you get in, and that adds the safety that is not present in the device. And I know that's what they do at NASA, but most people just take the device as it received from the manufacturer and just connect it directly to the internet and then are surprised when they get hacked. Anyway, um, so your, de your general purpose desktop OS uh, is now easy to patch. It usually has automatic patching, popping up, reminding you. Um, they try harder and harder to make you patch it. It's the most important security measure you can take to patch your OS. The problem with the embedded OS is you typically don't have a user at a control panel. It's something like your water pump, providing water you expect it to run for years without ever looking at it or doing anything to it. Um, so if somebody uh, finds a vulnerability, nobody wants to turn it off to patch it. They just leave it alone and don't worry about it because typically the people that install it are primarily like physical, mechanical contractor types and they really don't take the electronic cyber threat very seriously. They just worry about leaks in the pipes and failure of the electrics and stuff like that. Um, so open source software is certainly one way to go. If you use open source software, then there's a large community of people contributing patches and such. They used to brag about how their software was much more secure and much more stable than Windows. And that was true long ago, but it's not really true anymore. As we all know, there have been series in the last five years of appalling disasters in security and open source software. So it is no longer that simple. The fact is, uh, 
Windows can be secure if you set it up correctly, and Linux can be secure if you set it up correctly, and they're both a disaster if you don't set them up correctly. Uh, anyway, so like I say, the Linux kernel is maintained by a large group of people all over the world donating their time, although I think 90% of them are actually being paid by companies, because once a company decides to use open source software, they pay their developers to develop on it and release the code into the wild. Google does that, a lot of other companies. So a lot of people are professionals at work, but they're writing an open source product. And so if you use Linux, you have the benefit of all those patches coming in if you choose a mainstream. Pacemakers. Internal embedded medical devices are also computers, and they're also fantastically vulnerable. Um, there's been a, there's a guy named Joshua Corman who is trying to form a political action group for security professionals. He's trying to um, form something like the AMA's lobby. The American Medical Association, doctors pay a fee to belong to a sort of union, and they have a lobbyist in Washington that vigorously tries to prevent Congress from passing laws that will hurt doctors, um, which they love to do. I don't know if this is currently in vogue. I know several times in Republican administrations they have ordered all doctors to not even tell any woman who is pregnant that she could get an abortion, mention it as any possibility, or give her any clues how to get one if she wants one, and if they do, they'll be punished. That's something they very commonly, they very commonly want to pass laws like that from Washington that doctors don't want, and they need lobbyists in Washington to stop it. And Joshua Corman has been trying to form such a lobby for the security community because we are certainly in constant trouble from Washington. The, they always have some stupid idea that they're trying to ram down our throat. The latest one is they want to force all of us to give the government backdoor passwords to every device so that they can get through all encryption. And they stubbornly refuse to believe that weak encryption with a backdoor is not safe to use. They're convinced that we can somehow let in the good guys and keep out the bad guys because there are uh, people who find it politically expedient to sell that lie and politicians seem to have no actual intelligence. They just believe whatever they're told. Um, there's a saying in Washington, for every expert, there's an equal and opposite expert. So just ignore everything the experts say. That's even before the current entirely anti-intellectual administration took power. So anyway, um, the, what, what Joshua Corman found out when he went to Washington is they can't even understand what we're talking about when we talk about Linux vulnerabilities, Windows vulnerabilities, machines getting hacked. But they can understand this. If the medical devices get hacked that are beating your heart, that they can understand, that they want to do something about. And I think cars getting hacked, they can understand that. So they say, focus on those issues, and you might get some traction in Washington. Everything else at DEF CON is just gobbledygook to us. That's just the kind of science that we hate. You scientists babbling about stuff, they should just you know, make you go work in the fields and tell you stop pretending you're smarter than the rest of us and stop confusing us with big words and numbers and stuff. So um, anyway, there's a focus on this, and it turns out, of course, the medical devices were designed with no thought of electronic security because they're worried about other things like making it clean, making the battery last long enough, making it small enough, making sure that the plastic doesn't induce an allergic reaction and all that. That's enough problems. Cybersecurity was not on the map. Yeah? As far as I know, nobody has hacked a pacemaker and killed anybody yet. Although it certainly is possible with the earlier models. And that's why some people are worried about garage door openers and, elect and scanners because it just takes a signal, which is just a normal radio signal. It's not encrypted. There's no password. You certainly could hack pacemakers. And a lot of people have other implants, too. I know people with Parkinson's. I know a friend with Parkinson's, and she has a brain implant sticking electricity into her substantia nigra to help her Parkinson's, and that thing is probably hackable, too. So it's an issue. Um, anyway, um, all, so all your networking devices are good targets because you can change the flow of network traffic. You can hack a router and have it add malware to all the files you download, or, for example, or send an extra copy of all your messages to a third party or something. Um, your general purpose computers are target, as we know. And if you take over a router, you now have access to all the network traffic and all the network resources of that company, so you can use a router as your entry point into a network. Um, routers typically are very insecure. Home routers are, and quite a few enterprise class routers, too have uh, simple ways to just bypass authentication and become administrator on the device. Uh, there was a router hacking contest a few years ago and it was full of hilarious ways to just do everything to every brand of router, turn off the WEP, reset the administrator password, you know, so on. Um, they are very insecure systems. It's a uh, embedded OS hacking is a growing field and a lot of fun. So here's, here's one example, Burger's Engineering D-Link Backdoor. I thought this one was fun. I made a video about this one. It was unbelievable. I've got one of these D-Links. So the D-Link, if you set your browser user agent string to this string, which includes backdoor backwards, 
Um, if you make one connection with that user agent string, then every other computer connected to that router is the administrator forever. And the only thing that will fix it is the hardware reset back to factory default. Uh, this kind of thing is fairly common. It seems to me like several percent of all devices have unintended backdoors, and I think they are there for people to use during the um, design process. They keep fouling up the system and getting locked out of their own box, so they have a secret backdoor in, but someone forgot to remove it before they hit production. Anyway, uh, all right, so your printers and scanners and fax devices and the devices that combine these functions are, of course, also vulnerable on your network. And the, if you hack those, not only can you use them to attack the rest of the network, you can just steal the stuff that's being printed and faxed. That's often confidential stuff. Um, There's another thing that hit um, people pretty hard about five years ago when it came out is that modern copy machines have hard drives in them and they are never erased. So when you rent a copy machine, the hard drive is all full of data from the previous users and there's not any command anywhere in the function menu to clean it off because people didn't think about this. So there's extra copies of your potentially confidential documents just flying around on the hardware. And that's a big issue, remnants, leftover data on devices you're discarding. Uh, you can take over a printer and do all sorts of fun things. Um, there's a bunch of hacks that adjust things on the printer. If you just want to change the message it shows on the screen, that's often very easy to do and doesn't require any authentication, but that's not too serious. Yeah? On the new multi, like, copy or scan or whatever, is there a delete function? Um, well, I don't know. However, my understanding is a typical MFD device does not have a hard drive. It's just the big copiers to have. Right. Um, but it's a good question, and I would say nowadays we're probably nowhere near them actually adding the delete function, but we might be up to where they might, the tech support comp division might possibly understand the question when you ask them, are there extra copies of my document on here leaking out? Of course, to be fair, even the old drum Xerox machines left a photographic image of the last document printed on the drum. So anyway, it's... There's always some data remnant, and, uh, but the, the private sector didn't think about it as much as the military. Uh, probably the biggest issue these days is cell phones. I saw an article last week that said I think 80% of uh, used cell phones and tablets have leftover personal data on them. But what they didn't do is break it up into iOS and Android because I'm pretty sure that number is zero for iOS. Because ever since the iPhone 3S, everything is encrypted. So if you just, there is an item in the menu reset this, this thing to factory settings, delete all the data, and if you do it on an iPhone, it actually works. If you do it on an Android, it typically doesn't work. But anyway, um, so you can hack into the print. Another thing your printer can do is it has web pages. Your printer contains a web server, and you can go in there and change things like the uh, types of paper and stuff, and you could modify this page to have malicious links and serve up malware like any web page. So you could, that's one of the many ways you can use a printer to spread an infection to other devices on the same network. And typically, things that are already on the local area network have much more unrestricted network access than things from the outside. There's another one. You can update the firmware on the printer and change it to malicious firmware. You can do this with smartphones, too, IP phones used in companies. Um, they update firmware with TFTP from the local network. So if you put up a malicious TFTP server, they will see it as an update. And now you can change the firmware in the phone to do something, anything you want. And then there's SCADA systems. These are things most of us never heard about until about six years ago when they started hitting the news. These are factory systems intended to run big devices in networks. Um, and so they're supposed to be separated from the internet by an air gap, but of course, like I say, they frequently aren't because you can save so much money by administering them remotely. And so these control things like uh, factory assembly lines, nuclear power plants, aircraft control towers, and things like that. Um, Project Aurora was a 2007 test from the military. It was the first test which demonstrated widely that you could physically destroy a physical device with a cyber attack. So they sent um, malware into this system which controlled a generator and caused it to set the generator to uh, run it improperly and make it blow up. And it was shortly after this that we blew up the nuclear isotope separators in Iran, the same way with the cyber attack in conjunction with Israel. So, um, but this was the public demonstration that you should not assume that your hardware is safe from a cyber attack. I heard about another one about two years ago where you could disable the temperature sensor in computers and printers and potentially let them get too hot and catch on fire. So you could imagine a virus that burned down your house. 
Um, I don't think that actually happened yet, but it certainly is possible. And another thing I think that is now people are aware of is that the battery in your cell phone has about as much energy as a small hand grenade, and the Galaxy Note 7 demonstrated that. So I don't know if there's a software attack that will cause the battery to explode, but it certainly is a thought. Um, anyway, so Stuxnet is the one I mentioned. This was a joint military operation of the United States and Israel that was kept secret for a while, but leaked out. And this was a plan to infect these Siemens programmable logic controllers, which PLCs are like SCADA systems, they control industrial equipment. And they worked apparently with Siemens. They found out the Siemens um, product numbers. And apparently the Iranians were using Siemens controllers, which they purchased from Germany, to refine their nuclear isotopes, or perhaps indirectly. I don't think they can get them directly from Germany for that purpose. But they knew what the serial numbers were of the devices. And they made a, attack that, a worm that would infect PCs. It would then infect USB sticks. It would then get on these controllers because they're air-gapped. The only way software upgrades get on them or new commands is through a USB stick. And then it would check the serial numbers to make sure it was the exact devices they want to target. If it's not the right devices, it would do nothing. If it is the right devices, it would then use 4 zero-day exploits and tr uh, trick the nuclear isotope separators into running a little too fast and a little too slow which would cause them to break and also cause them to fail to refine the plutonium. So the Iranian nuclear uh, program failed and they started freaking out and they started executing their scientists for what they thought was sabotaging equipment and doing foolish things. And this certainly held back the Iranian nuclear program for several years with what I would call a nonviolent attack. Anyway, um, so a lot of people said SCADA systems are, should be safe because they're not supposed to be connected to the internet, they're supposed to be an air gap. And I found a, a discussion online about this, um, saying many, many of these systems are vulnerable in 2011. And the point is, um, they typically are connected to the internet. And one example I thought you'd like to see is this one. This is a Dell product that they pushed. Now, let me stop this current recording, because this is a separate video. Uh, quit this. This is 123 IoT. I don't remember what chapter it is. <laughs> 